Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's service. I'm going to start off by reading a scripture from the book of Mosiah and the book of Mormon. And this is Mosiah 2.4 RAV 4.2 B OPV. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. This week I have had the opportunity to talk to a number of people that are deep in despair. There seems to be a lot of despair going on right now for a number of reasons. Some of them are financial, some are spiritual, some are political, and there's a number of other reasons. But I would ask that as far as prayer requests go, please pray for these people. There are a lot of people mourning right now. They're mourning Christianity itself. They're mourning the nation that they live in. They're mourning their families. If we could please pray for these brothers and sisters that they'll be comforted in their time of need and that we will find these people to help comfort them because that is our duty as saints. I have not received many prayer requests for people that are sick currently. Uh, there is another person that has COVID so if you could please pray for her and the other people that are struggling still with this disease and the other pandemic, monkeypox and all the other illnesses. Um, it's also been brought to my attention that, oh yeah, some of the diseases that we have vaccines for are starting to come back. Um, I was talking to someone recently in the state of New York that's having a problem there. And so, yeah, diseases are on the rise, apparently. So please pray for the health of the saints in the world. But beyond that, I don't have a lot more requests, prayer requests. As always, I do ask that we remember to pray for those that are in need, that we will find them, they will find us. And that the saints will feel comfortable coming home, getting out of their isolation. So if you'd like to pause now to sing a hymn and say your opening prayers, please do so. And we'll be here when you get back. We are now going to have our moment of unity. I'm going to read the Shema. The way this works is, I'm gonna read it once in Hebrew, and then I will read it again in English, and then I'm going to pause so that all of those watching this video can, as one as saints, repeat back the English portion, and it will be available there on your screen. Shema Yisrael, Yeva Elohenu, Yeva Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yeva is our Elohim, I've been praying on what to talk about this morning for my message for this service. And while putting my temple clothes on, I felt impressed by the Spirit to just open the Book of Mormon. And wherever it fell, that's what the Lord would want me to talk about. And I opened it right to the second chapter of Mosiah and the RAV, fourth chapter in the OPV. And just so you know, the RAV is what Community of Christ or the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, their, their branch of our movement use, and the OPV is the Orson Pratt version that the Brighamites, that they use, various sects from both denominations. They may call it by different names, but that's what we collectively call it here in the fellowship. It just makes sense, makes things easier. But I felt impressed I was looking at it, I'm like, this is a lot. I mean, I really felt impressed to read like the first 10 verses here. 
But to start, I felt impressed to read what I did. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and the earth, and all things who shall come down among the children of men. I really feel like that is the central point of our movement. I mean, we are the Church of Jesus Christ. The Lord has called us the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because we are his saints in the latter days. I want to just briefly go over this and talk to you about this. I think that there is a lot of wisdom packed into these verses. So King Benjamin is just making an end of finishing his address. He's gone over the information that was given to him by the angel of the Lord. And so he looks around the multitude and what does he see? His people have fallen to the earth for the fear of the Lord has come upon them. They have viewed their own carnal state. And now they're saying, Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness for our sins and our hearts may be purified. Now keep in mind, the Book of Mormon tells us that they did have temples and synagogues. They were obeying the laws of Moses, which means that when this happened, they most likely had a feast. They most likely burnt offerings, sin offerings to repent. And in case you're wondering, there probably were Lehi's, I'm sorry, Lehi's, Levites there, because at this point they've mixed with the Mulekites, and so there's people from, other people from Jerusalem there, and there's no reason not to believe that some of them were from the various tribes. But that said, the important thing to know here is that they we're having religious services is my belief. I mean, I could be wrong, but that's my belief. That's my understanding of this. And now here they are in front of their king and they feel like they're not good enough. Why? Well, they're just going through the motions. We do that as Christians. We don't sacrifice animals, but how many of us go to church, whether it's here or in a building, and we listen to someone preach, we take communion, and then we go about our lives. Have we really had that mighty change of our hearts? Well, after hearing King Benjamin's words, these brothers and sisters did. And because of that, they're able to see their own egoism. They're able to see, honestly, from a very incorrect perspective, because they're saying that they're even less than the dust of the earth. And I would say that that's not true because we're the children of God. We're the creation of God. And because of that, our value is great, immeasurable. But which verse did the Lord tell me to read today? When I say the Lord here, I mean the Holy Spirit. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created the heavens and earth and all things. Now, on the page I'm looking at, that is right in the middle of the page. I guess a little bit above it, but about the middle. And that really is what binds us together as Christians. Our belief in Jesus Christ. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. You are the Church of Jesus Christ. I am the Church of Jesus Christ. When we worship together, that makes us a fellowship of Christ. But what has the Lord called us? He's called us the Church of Jesus Christ, the people of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, because here we are in the latter days. Which is why this movement is named the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And yes, there's a number of churches out there that have grabbed a hold of that term that God has called us and used it to create organizations here upon the earth. But here's the thing. They're in their moment of despair. They're realizing their pride and egoism. They're realizing that their they're nothingness and the nothingness they feel is because they realize that as much as they try to go out and get to appease their egos, their egos will never be satisfied. Never. 
Imagine that. Imagine having a bowl. A bowl that can never be filled. Not that it runneth over, but the more you put into it, the bigger and bigger and bigger it gets. That's egoism. That's worldliness. We see this as people who have in this world, they, they fear that it's never going to be enough. And so they don't share. They hoard their wells like dragons. But here's the thing. Once you realize you've got this bowl, which isn't really that big, but it's, somehow it's never ending. And you realize in that pit of despair that you can't fill the bowl. And then you just go to God, not with your mouth, but with your heart. And in your heart, in that moment of realization that your ego can never be satisfied, that your desires will never be fulfilled on your own. And even if you're given the world, it'll just never be enough. Then your heart cries out for mercy. And you ask for the atoning blood of Jesus Christ to wash over and cleanse you so that you can be purified. And at that point, God comes. Let me get my hands higher here so we can see it in the, in the camera. God comes, and it says in verse 5 for the REV, verse 3a for the OPV, it came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy. That bowl that they have is now, it's just going to overflow forever with God's love, with the light of Christ. What's the difference? The difference is that with egoism, we want more, we want more, we want more, we want more. How much can we take? Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But the thing is that we're infinite beings. We've always existed and we always will exist. And so because of that, here in this finite perspective, there's that, that echo, that little bit that remembers that deep down inside of ourselves. And because of the infiniteness of ourselves, we expect an infinite amount of everything else. And that's our pride and egoism. But once we repent, and that just means return back to God, get back on the path. Once we accept Teshuvah, we accept the invitation of Teshuva, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the atonement of Jesus Christ. We stop saying, my will be done. And we look to God and we say, your will be done. Thy will be done. And at first, some of us will start doing what I like to call making excuses. Well, this bad thing happens, and so therefore, God must have set things up so that this and this will happen. But as we grow in grace, we begin to realize that it doesn't matter. We let go. When my wife and I became pregnant with our first child, it was very stressful for me because we were barely, we, we were doing okay. We had bought a house, but financially we definitely could have been better. And now my wife was gonna to have to stop working because it just didn't make financial sense to give all of her paycheck to someone else to raise our child, hand some of mine.
So I got on my knees, we prayed together, and it was decided that I would go back to college so that I could get a better job. And then shortly after our daughter was born, we became pregnant again. And that was okay. It was, it was a little rough because having two kids almost you know, just a little over a year apart, that's two small children. It's a little harder on my wife. And now suddenly I'm working full time and I'm in school full time. So I really wasn't around. I did my best to make myself available, but I was trying to figure out how to provide for this family. And then out of nowhere, the Lord tells me you need to quit your job. I called Christine and told her, and she said, if that's what you feel like is supposed to happen, then, you know, do it. And I did, I had no job lined up. At the time I was making some side money. So yeah, on top of going to school full time and working full time, I was making side money, <clears throat> fixing and selling computers. And so in my mind, I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and, and make this my career now. It'll give me more time for school and I'll be able to, you know, focus on this. But that dried up, it went away. I was building some websites for some people and I got another job. And I got that new job right when our third son, or I'm sorry, our second son, our third child was born. And I had lost the extra income, which wasn't a whole lot. You know, it was just a side gig. I mean, it's what I like to call garage sale money. It's just a little bit of extra cash to help out over here and there. But we lost that income. My wife wasn't working. I was in school, so I was accumulating debt. And I now had a new job. And shortly after that, this new job had me working in Washington, out of Washington, DC, but you know, every other week, as long as Congress was in session. And so that again, left my wife alone now with three children. And we became pregnant with twins. And all this time, why am I telling you this story? All this time, I just kept thinking, if I do this, this, and this, we're gonna be financially okay. If I do this, this, and this, we're gonna be financially okay. I wanna make sure we didn't ask for help from anyone. We were still members of the Salt Lake City Church, but I had grown up on their welfare system and I knew what a nightmare that was. I did not wanna put my family through that hell. So, In my mind, it was all on my back. We're at a family gathering with my wife's family, with my in-laws, and I'm sitting there and her grandmother asked me, you have three children. You're about to have two more. How are you gonna do this? How are you gonna do it financially? How are you physically going to do this? You travel for work and how is she going to raise five children while you're away? And I looked at her and, and in my mind, I gave up at that moment. I just gave up. I knew I couldn't do it. And I said, I don't know. It's in God's hands now. And she's like, David, you're right. It is. And I realized I'm right. It is. I'm putting all this on me. And that, that wasn't helping our marriage. It wasn't helping our family. It wasn't helping my psychological, spiritual, or emotional well-being.
my my cup I kept trying to, I just wanted to get it topped off. That's all I wanted. I wanted to top off that cup. And I didn't want to bother God or anybody else for help. But I realized that I, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it on my own. There's no way. Because I was working for a nonprofit, raises didn't happen. Because I was traveling, I couldn't get really get a second job. Because Christine had, you know, five kids at home and only a couple of them were in school. She couldn't go out and get another job. But the Lord could bless us. And so I did put it in the Lord's hands. And I realized, look, I I can only do so much. And even that little bit I can't do without you. So God, I need your help. I need you to step in here. I need you to take over. And what I realized while I was saying that prayer was, I need to realize that God's been in charge the whole time. I'm just a backseat driver. I'm just trying to tell God what to do based on my finite understanding. And now I've woken up. And I said, hey, God, you're in the driver's seat. You've got the wheel. If I could pick the radio station, that'd be nice, but it's all in your hands now. I'm not even the co-pilot. I'm just a passenger. My cup didn't change. My needs didn't change. But after that, my perspective did. I no longer felt that everything was on me, that it was all my responsibility. And here's what happened. How do you buy diapers for two babies at the same time? You don't. Christine was inspired by God to discover a modern version of cloth diapers. How do you make cloth diapers? It's a big investment up front, but then you don't buy diapers again. You're not buying diapers every time you go to the store. You don't run out, you just wash them. But still, that's a big chunk of change. How do you make it affordable? Well, you start a diaper business and you sell diapers to other people and you don't really need to worry about making a profit. Just make sure you're making enough that you get free diapers. And that's what Christine did. She made a little bit of extra money, but to her, this was a mission of love. How can she make these diapers safe, affordable? And that was what her focus was. She made sure these diapers were tested and she kept the prices dramatically low. That's the Lord at work right there. Our needs were met. And we kept doing it all the way up until our, our last child, our seventh child. And by making it a labor of love, we weren't constantly, oh, our cup is too big. We need more money in here. Instead, our infinite cup was always overflowing because it's about perspective. So what's my message for you today? 
I've been talking to a number of people this week that are going through spiritual crises. They're at the point here, just like the brothers and sisters in King Benjamin's day. They have fallen to the earth and the fear of the Lord has come upon them. And they view themselves in their own carnal state even less than the dust of the earth. And I know as many of you out there who feel you're not good enough, you're not worthy. You've been told that in order to receive blessings, it's tit for tat. God's not going to help you unless you help God. That's not true. God's always helping you. We just have to open our eyes and see it. Yes, there's times when bad things happen to good people. And it's easy to say God has a reason for all of it. And we can't always just turn around the perspective and say, oh, well, you know, God is good. This is why it happened. When I was younger, there were some high school students. This is back when I was in high school that were speeding. They went around a curve where they couldn't see and there they passed some people and got into a head on collision and died. And at their funeral, people kept saying, the Lord works in mysterious ways. The Lord wanted to bring those boys home. Sometimes things happen because we think we're so smart and we think we're so awesome that we dig our own pits. At the same time, I knew other people that were one, one boy I went to school with, his house had two bedrooms and he had a large family. His bedroom was a closet. He kept his stuff on the top shelf and there was some sort of mattress of some sort or blankets or something. I don't know exactly that he slept on in the closet under his clothes, under the, the few possessions he had. What did he do to deserve that? To live like that? Nothing. And there's no excuse for it. I believe that if we all turned our lives over to the Lord and we all let God take control, we wouldn't have people living like that. Homelessness would eradicate itself because we would see all the blessings the Lord has given us and then share those blessings with others instead of thinking, I need more for me. We don't have the answers to every situation. We don't know why every time. But what we do know is that God is good. That there's going to be opposition in all things. And that human suffering will always exist as long as greed exists. And let's be real. Even if we lived in a perfect utopia where there was no money and everyone just helped each other all the times, there's still going to be fires. There's still going to be earthquakes. There's still going to be floods. There's still going to be natural disasters. Disease will exist. Even with the best scientists working constantly, there will be people that won't be able to take vaccines, that won't be able to get cures because we're all built differently. The only reason I can give you for why is because all things are in God's hands. The Book of Mormon says, Lehi says in 2 Nephi, this is in the second half of the first chapter in the REV and the 
second chapter in the OPV, that there has to be opposition in all things, that we have to taste the bad in order to feel the good, to appreciate the good. As depressing as that sounds, I, I believe that it's true. Does that justify or excuse or give a good reason for my friend sleeping in a closet growing up? No, it does not. My other friend watching his father die of a heart attack in front of him is nothing anyone can do? No. That's why we're commanded as saints to mourn with those that mourn. Paul says we should also rejoice with those that rejoice. That's the easy part. That's the fun part. Everybody loves rejoicing. But how can we be there to mourn with those that mourn? How can we be there to help those in need? How can we be there for those that are viewing themselves in their own carnal state as even less than the dust of the earth? We can tell, we, but we can't tell them. We can try to, but we can't tell them to cry out for the atoning blood and mercy of Jesus Christ like they do here in the Book of Mormon. They have to do that themselves. But we can be the lighthouse. We can be the beacon. The light of Christ can shine through us as we love others, as we live our lives. And I believe that that is why the Lord has told me to ask you to come home. Because if you're mourning, let's mourn together. Let's find others in mourning and let's mourn with them. We're all broken. We all belong on the Isle of Misfit Toys, if you're familiar with that old Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Christmas program. But to God, we're not. We're the way we're meant to be. And the sooner we let go of our egoism and our pride and we realize this, then we can stop mourning together and begin rejoicing together. And that's my prayer, my message for you today. And I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to take the sacrament of communion together. I'm going to read our statement on communion. You know, it's recorded, pre-recorded, but and then Christine is going to read the sacrament prayers. After which, if you'd like to pause the video and partake of the sacrament, we will conclude after that. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, 
that they may witness unto thee, O God, the eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. I appreciate you taking the time to worship with us. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to the words and partake of the Spirit, feel the Spirit, as we worship Christ together. I do believe that we're unified as one, even though we're not all watching this at the same time. A couple last thoughts before our closing prayer. I want you to know that I do my best to be there at 10 o'clock to live chat with anyone that would like to be there at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and worship with us at the exact same time. That's on our YouTube channel. Feel free to join us there. There's a link to it at the top of the fellowship website, cjccf.org. The other thing is an ask. If this service has helped you or any of the other videos have helped you, please remember to share them on social media. It's my prayer that can help many people. And the more you share the videos, the more people will have an opportunity to find them. It's easy to pray and say, God, please bring these people here. We can help. We can do our part by sharing these videos with others. So with that, let's say our closing prayer, and I'll see you again in the next service. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before you at this time and thank you for this opportunity you've given us to worship together. To worship together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. At this time, we ask that you will accept us as a people accept us in our struggles accept us in our humility and accept us in our weaknesses we ask that you will provide for us you will forgive us of our sins and that you will bless us with the things we stand in need of. Help us to serve thee better, that we may bring the heavens down here upon the earth, that your will will be done here as it is there. Please bless us, that we will find those that are seeking you and share your love with them through our love for them and through our example. Help us to feel your spirit so we can speak to others spirit to spirit and speak to you spirit to spirit. Help us to listen better to know your will, to understand your will, that we may do your will. Help us as we struggle with our needs to see the needs of others, that both our needs may be met and their needs will be met. And not in our way, but in your way. Help us to seek not our will, but your will. and comfort our souls in Christ. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the technology and the means that you've made available, that your word may be heard throughout the world at the time of everyone's individual convenience, that everyone may be reached 
and worship together when you and they are ready. That we don't have to expect everyone to conform to our schedule or my schedule. Again, we thank you for all your blessings. We ask you to please bless us and those around us with all that they need and that we need to not merely survive, but to thrive economically, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. These blessings we ask for. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen.